in my view, it wouldn't. Uh, the research that has been done to date uh, suggests that uh, increasing penalties, not only in relation to this particular crime, but crimes more generally, uh, does not result in uh, a reduction in crime. Uh, so more broadly one might say that there's not much evidence in support of the theories that uh, increased penalties uh, create uh, more deterrence, either specific deterrence or general deterrence. Specific deterrence meaning deterring a particular individual, general deterrence referring to deterring um, others who might consider uh, engaging in particular behavior uh, but decide not to do so because of the uh, sanctions that may follow if caught. Um, there's, in fact, I think good reason to think that increasing the penalties may result in more harm to uh, abused women. Uh, we know that currently uh, the vast majority of women who experience violence in their intimate relationships uh, do not, for good reason, uh, contact the police. I think there's reason to believe that if the penalties were stiffer, um, many women would be even more reluctant to contact the police. Uh, while there may be some women who uh, would be more willing to contact the police with stiffer penalties, I do think that the overall effect would be a greater reluctance on the part of women to report. And that's because often what a woman wants to happen is she wants the violence to end, but very often she does not want her husband or intimate partner convicted of a criminal offense and doesn't want him incarcerated. That's because uh, in many relationships um, she uh, is still in love with him uh, and sometimes uh, she is economically dependent upon him and should he lose his employment uh, she risks poverty and potentially homelessness and for her uh, the violence is a lesser evil than um, being destitute and without a home. Uh, another risk for a woman is that when she goes to the police, uh, her abusive partner will say that she has been uh, assaulting him. And so she uh, risks the potential of a criminal charge. And as the penalties are increased, that means the risks for her of reporting and potentially having what's sometimes referred to as a counter charge laid against her. Uh, is really, I think, of concern. So overall, uh, I think there's good reason to believe that increasing the penalties uh, would not provide greater protection for women and children, and in fact, uh, could make things worse for them. Uh, I would start by saying that I don't think uh, our research and report could be credited with bringing about any particular changes. Uh, I think like so many other things uh, where change happens, it's the result of many, many different actors and many, many different initiatives uh, creating some critical energy, uh, a critical mass, and uh, spawning uh, some forms of change. So uh, I do hope that our research and our report in some small way contributed to some changes that did occur after the release of the report, but certainly wouldn't want to claim um, credit or responsibility for those changes. And the changes have been modest, um, but at least changes in the right direction. Um, one of the changes that occurred very shortly after the release of our report was a very, very modest increase in the rates for um, Ontario Works benefits or welfare benefits. Uh, they were, it was a really very small uh, increase uh, in nowhere came close to even matching the 21.6 percent reduction that had occurred uh, in the mid 1980s. So uh, it was a two or three percent increase. Um, another change that occurred was uh, with respect to the training of frontline workers. So there were new training modules developed and introduced across the province for those on the front lines delivering Ontario welfare benefits and so I think uh, that was a very positive development. Uh, at the same time though uh, there have been cutbacks to various um, services for 
um, women, including abused women. And uh, I don't think we could say that since 2004 there has been any kind of net overall reduction in the homelessness experienced by abused women. I think in relation to welfare, and this is true for some other systems as well, um, immigration is one that comes to mind, uh, it's often exceedingly difficult to get accurate and timely information. So information about uh, benefit levels, and for abused women in the welfare system, it's information about particular kinds of exemptions that you would be entitled to. So for example, ordinarily you have an obligation to pursue other possibilities of support and most significantly that would be to pursue child support if you're a single mother. Uh, that obligation can be waived at least temporarily for women in abusive relationships recognizing that sometimes pursuing child support can result in uh, an increase in violence or to create opportunities for uh, the abuse to continue. In our study we found that uh, not only did women often know about uh, benefit entitlements and special benefits in particular, but very very few women knew about the exemptions to which they were eligible or for which they were eligible um, as women experiencing violence. So uh, there are, I think, a variety of different strategies that could help make uh, knowledge uh, much more accessible. Uh, one, of course, would be to simplify the rules. I think anyone who's ever looked at the uh, welfare system have commented on not only the number of rules, but how um, complicated and counterintuitive they are. Uh, so the simplification of the rules is one important step. Um, transparency is really important. Um, I think there are a variety of different ways in which information can be broadly disseminated. So it's looking at um, the ways in which people travel in their day-to-day -day lives and where do they pick up and um, access information most often. So is it to have uh, information in public libraries or in laundromats or to come home with uh, notices from school? Uh, is it the internet? Uh, is it television? What are the various uh, medium that we could use um, that are really accessible, accessible for the people who need the information? So again, we might think about the particular situation of abused women, where many abused women are very, very isolated, and where uh, their actions uh, can be closely monitored by an abusive partner. So a woman in that situation needs to be able to safely access information. And so we have to pay really close attention to how do we safely get information to her. Um, I think often uh, peers are a very, very good model for um, providing information. Um, frontline service providers, so um, ensuring that shelter workers have access to the information that they need about the welfare system so that they can give women good advice about the welfare system. Um, I think there's a, a range of different kinds of strategies, not a single one uh, that we have to employ. And I think also we'd have to uh, imagine the uh, perhaps the responsibilities of the frontline workers within the welfare system a little bit differently and that is uh, to, uh, or for them to uh, be working within an environment where they are encouraged to see themselves not as adversaries but as advocates of those who are seeking support from the state.